If you brought a Bible, let me invite you to open it with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. It's incredible that we began the unfolding story with the book of Genesis way back in the month of January. And now here we are, the last Sunday of the month of September, and we are at a crucial moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, there are a lot of important questions that we often ask. What's for dinner? Will you be home for Christmas? Do I have clean socks? Do I have clean underwear? These are important questions that we have to ask. But there is no more important question than the question, who is Jesus? Because it's our answer to that question that determines our eternity. It's the answer to that question that determines the eternities of all those around us. This is our answer to the question, who is Jesus, that impacts the most the way that we behave and the way that we treat those around us. And this morning, as we come to this pivotal moment in the life and ministry of Jesus, Jesus is going to turn to his disciples, uh, turn to the men who know him the best, and he's first going to ask, uh, who do the people around you say that I am? What do they think about me? But more importantly, Jesus is going to ask them to answer the question, who do you say that I am? What do you think about me? And in Jesus asking his disciples that question, Jesus is also asking us that very important question. Who do you believe Jesus to be and has that changed your life? So with your Bibles open, let me invite you to stand as we honor the reading of our sovereign God's perfect word beginning in Mark chapter 8 and verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And Jesus said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words and this adulterous generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is God's word. Let's go to him in prayer for help. Almighty God, we praise you and we thank you that you have not left us alone, but you have revealed yourself to us through the written word. And we thank you that today we can come as, as a people who are broken and in need of good news. And we can submit ourselves to this word and that we can learn properly who your son Jesus is and what he came to accomplish and what that means for all of us. So Lord God, we pray that by your spirit, you would give to us what we do not have. Help us to understand and comprehend and believe and obey this text for the glory of Jesus and for the good of our church. Amen. You can have a seat. If the most important question that we will ever ask and answer is who is Jesus, then we must first begin as we open up this text with the person of Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, verse 27, we're told that Jesus and his disciples, who have been hanging out around the area of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus has been healing the sick and has been teaching as one with authority, he's been showing his power and his glory, he and his disciples begin to make their way up north toward the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is just on the other side of the border of Syria, not that far, maybe 40 miles or so from the city of Damascus. And it's there that Jesus decides that after two or two and a half years of his 
disciples following him and taking notes and learning from him, it's there in that moment that Jesus finally offers up his first pop quiz. First, who do people say that I am? And more importantly, secondly, who do you say that I am? Now, according to Mark chapter 8 and verse 27, this question is asked in Caesarea Philippi. And, and this isn't just an insignificant detail, but actually it's an extremely important detail because Caesarea Philippi was a city made up of many, many non-Jewish men and women. These were Gentiles. In fact, the original name of the city was Pontius after the Greek mythological god Pan. He was said to be a half goat, half man who played a flute and there were altars and there were temples and sanctuaries all over that great city where people would flock all around the world to come and to pay homage to and to sacrifice in honor of this mythological god Pan. But after King Herod the Great gave control of this region to his son Philip, Philip changed the name of Pontius to Caesarea in order to say in Pan, more than anything else in this city, more than any other god, we bow down to Caesar Augustus as Lord. But there was a problem. Because there was already a Caesarea in the region. It wasn't all that far away. So most people began to call it Caesarea Philippi. Meaning this is a Caesarea that Philip named. Regardless of the name of the city, it was made up of many non-Jewish people. Some who bowed down to the Greek gods like Pan. Others who bowed down to the Roman Caesar as Lord. But regardless, it was in this city that there was lots of confusion and doubt about who God really is. And about who might actually be the one who can do something about our, our, our needs and our sins and our brokenness. And so it was in that setting that Jesus turns to a students. And he says, boys, you're out there. As I'm healing the sick and as I'm teaching, you're with the crowds. You, you've heard the people whispering. You know what they say about me. What are the people saying about me? And, and, and Jesus begins to listen. And the students begin to say, well, some say you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist was that relative of Jesus who was the final Old Testament prophet. He wore camel hair and he ate bugs dipped in honey and he lived out in the wilderness and he preached to the people a message of repent and turn from your sin. But by this point in Mark's gospel, John the Baptist had already been killed. He had already been beheaded. But there were rumors and, and the gossip train was going around in which some people believed that John the Baptist had been reincarnated and that this Jesus was the reincarnated John the Baptist. That Jesus was preaching similarly to John the Baptist. So maybe John the Baptist has come back from the dead. Others said, no, no, this is not John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Now, Elijah was that great prophet of the Old Testament who preached in the days in which the kingdom of Israel had been divided into two. The northern kingdom of Israel in the north, the southern kingdom of Judah in the south. And both kingdoms were in despair and demise. And so God raised up Elijah to preach to the wicked king Ahab, to call him to repent, to call him to faith towards the Lord. And because of Elijah's faithfulness, the Bible tells us that the Lord allowed Elijah to not taste death. The normal course of life is you live and then you die, but not for Elijah. Because of Elijah's faithfulness, the Lord simply brought the living Elijah up in heaven. And so some people thought that one day Elijah would come back out of heaven. In fact, the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, said that before the Messiah comes, Elijah will come again. And literally the people thought that the same way that Elijah went into heaven, one day he would come out of heaven and the people would see him and they would know that the next thing, the next person that comes out of heaven, that'll be our Messiah. And yet Jesus teaches in the Gospels that when he said that Elijah will come again, he didn't quite literally mean Elijah. He meant the spirit of Elijah. He tells us that his relative John the Baptist is the promised Elijah who would come. And so obviously Jesus isn't him. Some of the other disciples said, well, some just say you're another prophet. Uh, you're just one who, who comes to preach the word of God like all the other prophets. In fact, there was a rumor that we read about in the first century that the great prophet Jeremiah would return. Jeremiah was that prophet who preached in the days of the Babylonian captivity. 
when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to the city of Jerusalem and destroyed its walls and destroyed the temple. And there was a rumor that in those days, the prophet Jeremiah had snuck into the Holy of Holies in the temple, had taken the Ark of the Covenant where the Lord would come meet with his priest once a year, and that he had taken it and he had hid it in Mount Nebo. And that one day, Jeremiah the prophet was going to come back and he was going to dig up the Ark of the Covenant from Mount Nebo. He was going to bring it back to the temple and all the people were going to know that the next one who comes is the Messiah. Now here's the thing about all the answers that the people have given about who is Jesus. For one, they're not negative answers. No one says, Jesus, you're demonic. No one says, Jesus, we think you're wicked. Uh, we think you're evil. We, we think you're sinful. No one says that. They all recognize that Jesus is special. They all recognize that Jesus is unique, that he's, he's sent and anointed by God to do something special. The problem is they simply don't see him as Messiah. They see him as a prophet, a man chosen by God, sent by God to do the work of God, but they don't see him as the one who will come to save the people from their sins. And I think this is important for us who live in the buckle of the Bible belt. Because we live in a culture, and, and happily so, in which there are many people that claim to know and follow Jesus. But the question is, is those that we come into contact with that know something about Jesus and say something about their belief in Jesus, do they believe that Jesus is unique, sent from God, he's a really good man, he's, he's important for us to know about, or they, do they actually believe that he is God's message in person and God's solution for our sin problem? Because those are two totally different ways of understanding Jesus. So Jesus then looks at his disciples and he says, so boys, I've heard what the others say about me, but what do y'all say about me? And so Peter, who would often stand up, who was bold and courageous to speak on behalf of the disciples, puts his hands in there, ooh, ooh, pick me. Jesus says, yes, Peter. And Peter says, you are the Christ. With that confession, Peter and the disciples make it clear that as they have watched Jesus perform miracles, they understand that he is more than a miracle worker. With that confession, Peter is saying that though they have heard the teaching of Jesus, they understand that Jesus is more than a prophet. He's more than a preacher. They understand that he is the Christ. In Matthew's version of the same account, Peter says, the son of the living God, we understand you're the one sent from heaven. Now, for a long time in my life, I thought Christ was the last name of Jesus. But that's not really true. Uh, Christ is a title. In the Old Testament, the title is Messiah. But in the language of the New Testament, the language is Christ. But both of these titles, both of these terms mean the same thing. Chosen and anointed by God. And in the Old Testament, there were three different offices that were chosen and anointed by God to serve and help the people. You've got the prophets who were chosen and anointed by God to preach the word of God to the people of God. You got the priest who were chosen and anointed by God to stand before a holy God in the place of sinful humanity and to offer sacrifices and to pray, to pray on behalf of the people. Then you've got the kings who were chosen and anointed by God to sit on the throne and to rule over God's people and also to do battle on their behalf. And now this word Christ or Messiah means chosen and anointed by God. And what Peter is saying is Jesus, we believe that all of the prophets in the Old Testament, that all the priests in the Old Testament, that all the kings in the Old Testament were preparing us and pointing us to you. That you're the ultimate prophet. You're not just the one who preaches the word of God. You're the word of God who was with God in the beginning, who was God, who became flesh and dwelt among us. 
We believe that you're the final priest who doesn't just stand between a holy God and sinful man to offer sacrifices, but who willingly becomes our sacrifice. We believe that you're the Messiah. We believe that you're the chosen anointed king who will come to rule over and to fight battles on behalf of God's people. We believe that all of our hopes and all of our dreams and all of our longings and all of our waiting has been fulfilled in you. And Jesus says, don't tell Saul about it. Which is kind of strange. Because I would think Jesus would want everyone to know. But there's a couple problems. He understands that the people are not ready to receive the fullness of the message of who Jesus is and what he came to do. But he also understands that not even Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthew, and the rest of the disciples, they don't even fully what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. As we're going to see as the text continues, they don't even know what it means when they say Jesus is the Christ. They don't know all that entails. And so how can they preach good news when they don't yet understand the fullness of the good news themselves? So the question that we're left with is not who do people say Jesus is, but who do you believe Jesus to be? Do you see him as just a good man who's worthy of emulation? A good example to follow? Do you see him as special, unique, uh, somebody that, that we should emulate? He's, he's unique from God, sent from God to do something special. Or do you understand him to be the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, who came to do for us in our place what we can never do for ourselves? And it's the answer to that question, your response to that question, that changes everything about you. But Jesus continues And he doesn't just point them to the person of Jesus, but he points them to the purpose of Jesus. Immediately upon receiving their confession about his identity, Jesus pivots to pointing them to his mission, to his purpose. And he says that the Son of Man must suffer. It's incredible because Jesus here is calling himself the Son of Man, which doesn't just simply mean that he's a man, though that's true, but he's also God. Now, the Son of Man was a title that these disciples knew because they read the Old Testament and they knew that that way back in, in the book of Daniel, that Daniel had spoken about a Son of Man who would come, according to Daniel chapter 7, with great authority and majesty and glory and power. They were waiting for a Messiah who would come with glory and majesty and strength and would overthrow the Roman Empire and would bring the Jews their victory. And yet now here's Jesus saying that this glorious son of man who has come will have to suffer. And the disciples had no category for that because they understood that Jesus was the son of man. They understood that he was the Messiah with power and glory and majesty. But the only concept they had for suffering It's from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, written 700 years before this, in which Isaiah prophesied that a servant would come who would suffer on behalf of God's people, who would be pierced for the transgressions of the people, who would be crushed by God. But for the Jews, they saw the Son of Man, the Messiah, as one glorious figure, and the suffering servant as another. And yet Jesus is saying, they're both here in one singular person, and my name is Jesus. Jesus. I'm the glorious son of man who has come, but the way that I receive my glory is from suffering. That the way that I will come to receive my majesty and honor and praise is not by just sitting on a throne with a crown of gold, but by going to a cross and receiving a crown of thorns. And notice Jesus doesn't just predict that he will die. He doesn't even just say that it will probably happen. No, Jesus said that he must die, that he must be rejected by the Sanhedrin, the ruling people, that he must be handed over to die. Why? Because God's plan A for the salvation of sinners is not a get right with Jesus plan of moral implications and obedience. God's plan A for the salvation of broken people, God's plan A for the redemption of humanity is not a plan that we're to follow, but a person that we're to submit to. 
Jesus has come on the scene, and the sole purpose for which he has come is to die in the place as a substitute for sinners like us. And apparently when Jesus spoke, he spoke in plain language according to verse 32. Like he didn't use some kind of unknown tongue. He didn't use these big theological words and jargon that the disciples couldn't understand. They understood exactly what Jesus said. The problem is when they heard that Jesus was going to suffer, they zoned out and totally forgot the fact that Jesus said that on the third day he would rise again. Which means that Jesus is saying that I will suffer for sins and I will go to the death, but sins can't keep me down and death can't hold me like chains. I'm greater than sins. I'm more powerful than death. I'll rise from the grave. But but they're not hearing it because all they can think about is suffering and the way that that's beneath a Messiah. That's beneath one of great glory and majesty and honor. That's beneath one who has been sent by God to rule over God's people. And so Peter boldly takes Jesus aside and corrects Jesus. Can you imagine this? I, I was in a seminary class one time, and there was a guy on the front row. And literally every single class, he would raise his hand and argue with the professor as if he knew more than the guy that was teaching us about the subject. And it drove me nuts. And this is exactly what Peter's doing here. Like, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry, but I've read the Old Testament. And there's glory and there's majesty and there's overthrowing all principalities. You can't suffer You misinterpreted that part. And what does Jesus look at Peter and say? He doesn't say, brother, get behind me. He doesn't say, son, get behind me. He doesn't say, bud, get behind me. He doesn't say, friend, get behind me. He looks at Peter and he says, get behind me. And then he calls him the great adversary, Satan. It's incredible. Peter is the first one to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that the Christ, the Son of God that they've been waiting for for generations has come, and he's a Middle Eastern man born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. Peter's the first one to confess it, and two minutes later, he's now being called demonic, evil. This this brings me good hope, right? Like, Now, why would Jesus call him satanic? Do you remember, for those of you that have been tracking with the unfolding story, that the first thing that happened when Jesus began his public ministry is he went out into the wilderness to the Jordan and he was baptized by his relative, John the Baptist. And when he was baptized, what happened? The Spirit of God came upon Jesus, anointing him as the Messiah, the Christ. And the heavens opened up, and God the Father declared, this is my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. And what's the very next thing that took place? Jesus was led by the Spirit deeper into the wilderness, where for 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted by the adversary, the tempter, the devil, Satan, and all the temptations of Satan centered on one thing. Jesus, let me give you food now. Let me give you a kingdom now. Let me give you power, dominion, authority now so you don't have to go to the cross later. Satan was offering Jesus victory without death. He was offering Jesus a crown without a cross. But did Jesus give in to the temptation? No. So fast forward a couple years, Jesus is hanging out with his pupils, and Peter is saying the same thing. No, no. Jesus, you're the Messiah. You can get glory and honor and fame and renown and majesty. You don't have to suffer. And in that moment, Peter is not falling in line with the plan of God, but he's falling in line with the plan of the serpent, which is bent on trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross. Why is that important? Because not only at the cross does Jesus pay for salvation for sinners like you and me, but at the cross, he 
crushes the head of the serpent, Satan, according to Genesis 3.15. Satan knows his demise is coming if Jesus goes through with the plan. And so even when Jesus' closest friend, Peter, says, oh no, Jesus, you can't go to the cross. In that moment, Jesus is saying, you're being demonic. You're acting evil. You're, you're acting like Satan because I must suffer. I must go to the cross because if there is no cross, there is no glory. If there is no cross, there is no salvation. If there is no cross, there are no sins forgiven. Without a cross, why am I here? He says, Peter, your eyes are too downward. You're looking too much at the cares of man. You're thinking too much about earthly matters. You need to take your eyes upward and you need to gaze at God and set your mind on the things of God because God's plan from the beginning, if you read the Bible with Jesus in mind, is to send a Messiah who achieved glory, honor, and praise by going to a tree and dying in the place of sinners. It's not enough for us to identify with Jesus as a good, unique man, not even a good prophet. It's not even enough to say that, that we've given our hearts to Jesus unless we understand that the Jesus that we're trusting and believing in and giving our hearts to is the one who comes and reclaims glory by dying in the place of sinners. Substitution, Jesus, the spotless Savior in the place of sinners, is at the heart of the gospel. And Jesus says, the moment you, you lose that, the moment that you preach a Christianity without a cross, you have missed Christianity. Moral Christianity is not Christianity unless it's cross-filled Christianity that preaches morals as implications of the cross. Jesus is making sure that our focus as Christians, our focus as disciples is on the cross. And so today, have you trusted Jesus? Have you put faith in Jesus, his cross, his death in our place for the salvation of sinners? Have you believed in Jesus? Jesus presses on, and now as he's talked about his own identity and his own mission, he presses on to teach us about the pursuit of Jesus. He tells us in verse 34, as he gathers the crowds and disciples around him, the people who have been witnessing perform miracles and listen to his teaching, including the disciples who have just said in the midst of this pagan city where people are bowing down to a half goat, half man that plays a flute, in the midst of the city where people are bowing down to Caesar and calling him Lord, in the midst of all of this confusion about who God is, they've said, you're Christ, you're Jesus. And Jesus says, that's right, and I've came to suffer. I've come to die. I've come to rise again. And now Jesus looks at them and says, so if you want to be a part of me, here's what it looks like. And when Jesus preaches, he doesn't preach easy believism he preaches lifetime fellowship. He says, first, if you want to follow after me, if you want to come after me, you got to deny yourself. you got to give up your own self-interest. Give up what you think is best for your life. Give up what you think is best for people and, and live to what Jesus says is right according to God's word. You've got to deny your own self-interest, your own plans. Number two, you've got to pick up a cross. And in this context, a cross wasn't just a symbol that we wear around our necks or on our earrings, though rightfully so, to memorialize what Jesus has done. But, but at this time, the cross was nothing but a symbol of torture and death, an instrument of destruction. Jesus says, if you're going to follow him, you're going to have to pick up a cross. Just like Jesus walked to Calvary's hill carrying his cross to die for our salvation, Jesus says, if you want to follow him, you too are going to have to pick up a cross and you're going to have to follow after him if you want salvation. You're going to have to be willing to die to what people think about you and willing to die to, to what people uh, think or, or say or their ideas or opinions about how life works best. You, you're going to have to die to what you want best, what you think is right, in order to die so that with Jesus you can live. If you want to be with Jesus for eternity, Jesus says, with him you're going to have to die so that with him you can be raised to life. And only then, number three, Jesus says, can we follow him? Notice 
this idea of following Jesus isn't just a momentary decision made in time. It's a lifetime of discipleship that sure begins with a momentary decision, but continues on throughout the course of life. Jesus isn't after decisions. He's after disciples. Jesus isn't after people that have a one-time religious experience. He's after a people who have a lifetime of pursuing him according to his word. And so Jesus begins to clarify what that means by giving us four conditional four statements. The first being in verse 35 where he says, For whoever who would save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Jesus is saying for the person that, that wants to try to win on this earth, who wants to amass power and authority today, you're going to lose it in eternity because your heart is going to reveal that Jesus isn't your priority. But for those who are willing to lose now, to give up reputation, glory, and power now, on the day to come, you're going to be exalted with Christ. And on that day, you'll be on the winning team with Jesus the victor. He goes on to give us the next two conditional statements that go together, verses 36 and 37. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? The answer is like, like what does it gain you? To amass glory and honor and money and fame and reputation and strength now, only to see it disappear in a cloud of dust in the day to come. Nothing we gain today will be with us in the days to come, save for our intimate relationship and fellowship of Jesus. And Jesus is inviting us into that kind of life. He's inviting us into that kind of discipleship where we're willing to give up today in order to get for eternity. And how does that come? How does that become reality? It's only through Jesus. And finally, he says in verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me now, and this sinful and adulterous generation where all manner of things are said about Jesus, for those who want to go along with what the culture says about Jesus, who want to doubt the word of God, for those who, who want to reject Jesus now, he says, and the days to come, on the last day when you stand before Jesus as judge, on that day you'll find yourself being rejected. But for those who are willing to suffer rebuke, now, for those who are willing to suffer with Jesus now, who are willing to be despised now, because your love for Jesus supersedes your love for popularity or your love for acceptance, then on that day you will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus is pointing us to who he is and ultimately, he is the Christ. He is the fulfillment of all of the hopes of the Scriptures. The one who comes to bring God's glory and honor. Yes, but how does he do it? By fulfilling his purpose of dying on a cross. And now, for those of us that want to find new life in him, Yes, we believe. Yes, we trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we continue to follow Jesus. And we're willing to suffer with Jesus because the Bible teaches that glory usually comes through suffering. That there's only resurrection when there's first death. And that's the kind of life that Jesus is calling us to. So quickly... Who do you say Jesus is? God, I would hate on a morning like this morning for anyone to leave and to be uncertain about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah who came to die to suffer in your place for your sins, resurrected on the third day. Will you turn to him and believe? Will you turn to him and follow him? Will you suffer with him? And this life that he calls you to is, is a life of beauty and joy, of salvation. There will be great blessings, eternal life, forgiveness of sins. But it's also a life of hardship and suffering. Are you willing to do that because you find that Jesus is more beautiful than any suffering you could ever experience? And for those of us who have already put our trust in Jesus, are you following Jesus are you day after day after day denying yourself, picking up your cross, suffering, 
and following after him because that's the life of the disciple, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is the fulfillment of our hopes and our longings. He is the one who has come as the Messiah, the anointed one chosen and sent by you out of love to save us and rescue us from our sins through his death and his resurrection. I pray today that if there are those that are here that have yet to follow Jesus, to begin an intimate relationship with Jesus by trusting Jesus, I pray that now in this moment that they would turn toward Jesus. God, that they would cry out to Jesus, Jesus, save me, have mercy on me, a sinner. And for those in the room that are already disciples, I pray, God, that in these days of a sinful, adulterous generation where people all around us mock Christians and all around us doubt the Word of God, I pray, God, that you would give us endurance and courage to live for Jesus, to follow after Jesus, and to live for the affirmation of you, our God, and not the affirmation of the world. We pray this through Jesus. Amen.